My name is Graham Steele. I used to be a politician. 15 years, three years as a staffer, eight years in opposition, four years in government, most of that time as a cabinet minister. I was, for three years, Nova Scotia's Minister of Finance, dealing with budgets of billions of dollars and dealing with all the important public services like health, education, transportation, environment, support for the poor and disabled, all of the thousand things the modern government does. I was elected four times, which means that I've knocked on thousands of doors, and I have thousands of stories to tell you from the people that I represented. But let me tell you just one, one story that sticks with me, and it was from my first campaign 15 years ago. Nobody knew who I was. I went and knocked on a door, and the lady answered the door, and I smiled, and I started my spiel, and she stopped me, and she pointed at me, and she said, you're liars. You're all liars. And she slammed the door. And I was left in protesting meekly to the door. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a liar. You don't know me. But fast forward 15 years, and I ask audiences, when you hear the word politician, what's the first thing that comes into your mind, and the answers are always the same. A whole thesaurus of synonyms for liar, crook, in it for themselves. We should worry about this. We should worry about the fact that our political leaders are held in such contempt because they're the people whose very job it is to lead us to a better world. You know, when we're busy studying or shopping, or sleeping, or watching the big game, they're supposed to be on the job on our behalf as our elected representatives. But instead, we see them as a kind of alien species, what you might call a political animal. We don't understand what's going on in their heads. We don't understand why they do what they do. We don't understand how they reach the decisions that they've reached. And when they try to tell us, we don't believe them. And that disbelief is eating away at the roots of our democracy. And that disbelief spins out in many different forms, disillusionment detachment, cynicism, suspicion, conspiracy theories, support for candidates who are manifestly unsuited for public office, <laughs> anger, apathy. Now, when I was in politics, sometimes I felt like an anthropologist who'd been sent to study a new and unknown culture, or like a primatologist like Diane Fossey, who devoted her life to living among and studying the mountain gorillas of Rwanda. Now, unlike Dr. Fossey, I did not further my research with a daily and minute examination of my subject's night soil. <laughs> but I lived among the politicians. I was so devoted to my job that I became one of them. I know what they're thinking. I know why they do what they do. So I've come here today to share with you three of their secrets. The first secret is they're just like us, your politicians. In fact, they are you and me. They are ordinary people of ordinary ability and ordinary backgrounds who have been put in a distinctly unordinary environment. And they react to that environment the same way that you and I would react 
or at least the same way that I reacted. And I know it's not just me, because there are lots of people better than me, smarter than me, who have gotten into politics with the best of intentions, and when they come out, either a short time or a long time later, they wonder why they didn't have more of an impact. It's what one recent book called The Tragedy in the Commons, which was based on exit interviews of eight former Canadian members of parliament and the themes of disillusionment and disappointment in their own political careers runs throughout the book. Second secret, politicians are overwhelmed by the job. There is nothing in their background or their experience that has prepared them for this job. And if you ask politicians, why did you get into politics, you will almost always get some variation on the answer, because I wanted to make a difference. And good intentions are all very well, but it's not enough. We don't choose people like surgeons or auto mechanics or teachers or police officers just because they wanted to make a difference. Can you imagine being on the operating table and you look up at your surgeon and your surgeon says, no, I've never been to medical school. In fact, I've never been in an operating theater. I'm here because I want to make a difference. <laughs> no, it's ridiculous. But that's what we do with our politicians. And just to give you one example, the modern healthcare system is too much for any one person to uh, control, to oversee, even to understand. And yet we ask our health ministers to do it every day. The, the number and difficulty, the complexity of, the, of healthcare issues, and the number and ferocity of entrenched healthcare interests are enough to make the wisest person weep. And one former health minister has been quoted as saying that doing that job is like walking into Niagara Falls every single day. And so what our politicians learn to do is they learn how to cope. They learn survival strategies. And that's what I wrote about in my book, which is called simply, What I Learned About Politics. Because you're overwhelmed, you learn how to get by. You learn never to admit mistakes. You learn never to apologize. You learn never to say that you have doubts so that you don't know exactly what you're doing. You learn loyalty to the party and to the leader. And everything that matters you take behind closed doors so that nobody can see what you're doing, lest you be criticized. You know, in some ways there's not an awful lot of difference between our politicians and the mountain gorillas of Rwanda. Like Diane Fossey's guerrillas, your politicians organize themselves into groups. We call them political parties. And like Diane Fossey's guerrillas, those groups are strictly hierarchical, and your politicians learn how to obey the hierarchy and not to step out of line and do what they're told. And like Diane Fossey's guerrillas, your politicians learn that loyalty is the paramount organizing principle. The third secret is that your politicians tell themselves a story, and that story is wrong. They're ordinary people, overwhelmed by the task that they've taken on, and they tell themselves a story that, well, they may not be perfect, but at least they're better than the other guys. Sure, we make mistakes, but the other guys made worse mistakes. If you think it's bad now, just imagine what'll happen if you elect them. And if you doubt me, all you have to do is attend any session of our legislatures, any session of our parliament, and what is being talked about there in what is supposed to be the pinnacle of our democracy has nothing to do with making a better world 
and everything to do with promoting your own party and beating down the other parties. Towards the end of my political career, in fact, at the very end, I realized to my chagrin that I was not better than the person that I had replaced. And my party was not better than the party that we had replaced. And if you think that that's not much of a revelation, you've never heard a politician say that out loud before. Because it undermines every single thing that our politicians and political people tell themselves every day about why they deserve to be in public office and not somebody else. So that realization that came right at the end of my political career at first was depressing because it did undermine everything that I had believed for 15 years. But then I found it liberating because that realization pointed the way forward. Because remember that underlying everything that we're talking about today is this question, how do we get our politicians to lead? And the answer is, we don't. It's the wrong question. We're looking in the wrong place. We put people in this environment, and then we expect them to react differently than anybody else would react in the same circumstances. If we're expecting them to be anything other than a political animal, we are going to continue to be disappointed. The change is not going to come from your politicians. It's going to come from citizens. Because politicians are not going to change until their environment changes, until the, the system of rewards and punishments change, and that's in your hands. But it's not just any citizen who's going to make this difference. The people who are going to make a difference are what I call the effective citizens. And right now, I'm working on a second book on this idea about what it takes to be an effective citizen. And the best way that I can tell you what that means today is to tell you another story about the most effective citizen group that I have ever seen. It was a local group in this community where we are right now today, and it was a group of parents who came together around a sick old school. It was making the people inside it, their children, their teachers, it was making them sick. And the parents came together to try to close and demolish that sick old school and build a healthy new school. But they knew it wasn't going to be easy, so this is what they did. First, they started by building community support. They built a foundation among all the elementary schools and junior high schools that flowed into this sick old high school building so that they would have the commitment of the people who had a direct interest in making sure that that environment was healthy. They built lines of communication going up and going back down again so everybody had a chance to be heard so that everybody felt well informed, so that when that group said, we speak for our community, the politicians knew that it was true. The second thing they did was build a knowledge base, whether that was within their own ranks or if they had to reach outside, they went and got it, so that they learned more about how buildings work, what makes a school building sick, and how to build a new healthy building. They knew more about that than the politicians and the civil servants who advised the politicians. And lastly, they were persistent. My experience of that group, first as a would-be politician, then as an elected politician, was they were relentless. They were resolutely nonpartisan. They included everybody around the table. How do we fix this problem was the only question that they wanted to be answered. They were not interested in party politics. They were not interested in personalities. So I experienced them like a snowball rolling downhill. You were going to become part of them or they were just going to roll right over you. 
that's what it takes to be an effective citizen. We have got to stop waiting for that politician who tells us what to do, who, who solves all our problems, who looks after making a better world for us. Political power isn't out there. Political power is in here. And the person to your left and to your right and in front of you and behind you. Because effective citizens, engaged, knowledgeable, and persistent, united in a common cause, are the most powerful force that ever was or ever will be. So what are you waiting for? And the politicians, if you lead, they'll follow. Thank you.